He was the son of a World War I pilot. His earliest memories were the sounds of aircraft starting in early morning. Two years before the United States entered World War II, he tried to enlist in the RAF, but at 17 was too young. A year later, he went to West Point, where he played football and made All-American. He was one of the most natural fighter pilots his instructors had ever seen. A kid who seemed to meld with his plane into a single being. On his first combat mission, he shot down two German fighters. By the end of the war, he destroyed 13 German planes in the air and 11 and a half more on the ground. He sat out Korea, but in Vietnam flew more than 150 combat missions. He was a hard-drinking, hard-cussing officer who didn't bother to hide his contempt for the limits politicians had placed on the war. I think he ruffled feathers and made people very, very uncomfortable because often what he was saying was absolutely true and was going against what people were expecting him to say. He was nonetheless so well respected by the Air Force press, they made him Commandant of Cadets at the Air Force Academy in hopes that he would pass his passion and tactical brilliance on to the next generation of Air Force officers. He is Brigadier General Robin Olds, and he is a legend of air power. Robin Olds was born in 1922 in Honolulu, Hawaii. His mother died when he was four years old, and his life was dominated by his father, Major General Robert Olds, himself a flyer and a confidant of Billy Mitchell. Well, his father, uh, General Robert Olds, was uh, one of the uh, pioneers in military aviation, and uh, Robin grew up with that background. He grew up uh, with people coming to his house uh, every night or, you know, on weekends that were the pioneers of aviation uh, when military aviation was just starting. So he, he got indoctrinated pretty early. He spent most of his youth living on base in Langley, Virginia. His father played a prominent role in convincing a skeptical bureaucracy that the country needed to spend more money on combat aircraft. Oles remembers the uproar among flyers when President Coolidge asked, in all seriousness, why the Army didn't simply buy one airplane and let the pilots take turns flying it. But mostly what Oles remembers is growing up among the camaraderie of those early aviators in a world that seemed to him to revolve entirely around airplanes. When I was a little boy, the first noises were engines of airplanes warming up pre-dawn. And I could tell one engine from the other, even when I was four or five years old, to my dad's delight. And I'd, I'd sneak down to the, and watch the aviators, watch the pilots. And I, I remember once, years later, I ran into a, a fellow who had been a sergeant there at, at Langley, and he told me the story of going into a hangar once. There was one plane sitting in a hangar. And no one was around, but all the controls were moving. And he walked up to the airplane and looked in this open cockpit, and there I was, down in there, I was about six years old, working the controls for all I was worth. While there was never any doubt that he'd end up a pilot, his father insisted he get a proper education. But when the Germans invaded Poland in 1939, Old showed up at the Canadian Embassy and tried to enlist in the Royal Air Force. They laughed at me. They have to get permission, your parents' permission. So I, Dad had just moved to Washington. I went home, he came home from work. He said, what are you doing here? And I said, Dad, I want you to sign this piece of paper. Well, it took about a week to scrape him off the ceiling. <laughs> and back in prep school I went. That was the end of that. After graduating high school, Olds considered enlisting and trying to fight his way into the Air Corps. But the rules at the time made that route difficult. 
And, having watched reserve officers struggle to gain a regular army commission, he opted instead for West Point. He had, he admits, a romanticized view of what his career would be like. I'm going to go to West Point, and I'll have a regular commission, and I'll fly airplanes, and I won't have to work for a living. <laughs> and so I went to West Point. There, he says, he learned the most valuable lessons an officer can learn. To associate and trust the people around you. To take orders, and to ignore fun and games. He impressed his teachers with his drive and focus, which was also evident on the football field. He played tackle, and in 1942, made the All-American team. By then, of course, football seemed an almost irrelevant diversion. The Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor, and the United States was no longer dominated by pacifists who believed we could stay out of the war. Olds took his basic and advanced flight training at Tiny Stewart Field, just north of West Point. From the first time he put his hands on the stick, he knew flying was exactly what he was meant to do. You're the brains. You know, you're the, the blood. The aircraft is the, are the muscles. And this, each explosion of a cylinder, each whirl of the prop, every movement of the aircraft translates itself into you through your body, and you react, or it reacts to you. You don't think, now I'm going to do this and pull back and go up there. You, you're just, you're there. You don't think about it. It's instinctive. Two months before Olds graduated, his father died. Robert Olds was only 47 years old. The flyers he had grown up with were scattered around the world and could not attend the funeral. So Olds graduated from West Point an orphan. His family was the Air Corps his father had helped make, a force that had fought for its very existence while young Olds was growing up. It had flowered into a full-fledged strategic force the only force in the early months of the war capable of striking significantly at the enemy. Olds learned to fly P-38s in Arizona and California. He and all his classmates were anxious to get overseas, to get into the battle and test themselves. But they were caught in what Olds refers to as a catch-22. The Army wanted the Academy graduates to go overseas as flight commanders but didn't want to promote pilots to command who didn't have battle experience. And once it really soaked in that we weren't going anywhere, my friend and I, Al Tucker, went down to the L.A. Fighter Wing headquarters, found a sergeant who said, you guys really want to go to war? I said, yep. He said, where do you want to go? I said, we want to go to England. He typed out, 20 minutes later, we had orders. So the moral of that is, if you want to get something done, in the service, go to the sergeants. Olds and his partner were off to England and the war. It took them less than a week to get there. Olds had never been so excited about anything in his life. Lieutenant Robin Olds arrived in England with the 479th Fighter Group in May 1944. In only a few days, he strapped into his P-38 and flew off with his squadron for a mission over occupied France. And there, the squadron flew around in circles, not bothering to attack anyone. And I'm sitting up there getting more angry and more angry, cussing in my oxygen hat. Looking down, there's a train, there's trucks over here, or airfield there. And all enemy trying, this is prior to D-Day. Hey, why don't we do something? After a few up and down missions, Olds and his wingman cooked up a scheme to get themselves into combat. While flying over the French countryside, Olds radioed his commander that he saw a moving train and was going down after it. Roger, came the reply over the radio, and down Olds went. He made two passes at the train before his squadron arrived to back him up. And as he was swinging around for a third pass, when an angry voice on the radio ordered everyone back into position at a safe altitude. Back at the base, the major in command of the mission confronted Olds wanting to know why he had disobeyed orders by attacking the train. Sir, I called you. I said, this is New Cross lead. This is Blue 3. 
I got a train at 7 o'clock. I'm going down. Will you cover me? And you said Roger. He said, I didn't say Roger. You know what that's called? Gotcha. Gotcha. It was my wingman. And we had set it up. While the strafing run on the train might technically have counted as Ohl's first combat, his first air-to-air -air engagement occurred a few days later. Assigned a night mission, though they were not equipped with night fighters, Ohl's ended up separated from his squadron. Rather than returning to base, he continued on with the mission, flying alone toward a bridge in eastern France. He found the bridge just as dawn broke over the continent and was on his way back to base when he spotted a couple of planes on the far horizon. And don't, don't ask me to explain, but you know immediately, enemy. If something, something tells you, enemy. 99.9% .9 enemy. But that one-tenth of one percent, I cut them off through the field, came up underneath and behind, and there were 190s, two of them. So we went roundy round and I shot them both down. Because of a design flaw in the P-38 gun camera, Olds expected there wouldn't be definitive records that the dogfight had even taken place. He returned to base sure he was going to be in trouble for going on the mission alone, and decided not to even bring up the kills for fear that no one would believe him. Sure enough, as he climbed out of his plane, his commander was waiting for him on the ground. The commander was mad, but not very. A bomber flying high over the battle had reported the kills. On his next mission, his flight came upon a large group of German fighters bearing down on a group of American bombers. We pulled up behind them, and just as I was about to fire, both engines quit, because in my excitement, I'd forgot to switch tank. And I, what the hell, I fired anyway, so I've always, all these years since I laid claim to the fact that I'm the only fighter pilot in the history of aerial warfare that shot down an enemy aircraft while in the glide mode. He got his engine started again and returned to battle. He got two more kills that day. In only two air-to-air -air engagements, Robin Olds had shot down five enemy aircraft. He was officially a fighter ace. He was quickly promoted, first to captain and then to major. By the end of the war, he was one of the most famous pilots in the world. A dashing hero with an outsized personality and a total of 24 and a half kills. 13 in the air, the remainder German aircraft on the ground. Not long after the war ended, Olds was summoned to Supreme Air Force headquarters in France. When he got there, he was shown into a room that was filling with what Olds refers to as a book of heroes of the war. Generals, Medal of Honor recipients, half the staff of the Supreme Allied Command. All were awaiting the arrival of their host, General Carl Tui Spatz. Spatz had been an old friend of Olds' father, a pioneer military aviator who had been in charge of American air operations in the European theater. When he walked into the room full of heroes, Spatz greeted Olds first. Before he spoke with anyone else, he ushered the 22-year-old Major into a side room for a private chat about Olds' father and the young officer's career. Gave me some advice for the future about me first as me tours, Deadwood, dedicated people, you know. You know. Then he said, look, um, look, uh, here's, and he pulled out a wad of, of francs. He said, here's about 500 bucks I won off poker from those fellows out there. He said, my car is waiting for you out front. I'm going to Paris and get lost, which I did. After the end of World War II, the Army Air Force took its rakish, heroic fighter race and assigned him to coach football at West Point. Robin Olds reported as ordered, but wasn't happy with the assignment. Thankfully, it lasted only a few months, and then he was transferred to California to fly the Air Force's first combat jet, the P-80 Shooting Star. It was like flying a jet-powered glider, wonderfully acrobatic, agile, you know, no nav equipment. I mean, everything was still dead reckoning, but, but fun.
Olds helped form the Air Force's first jet acrobatic team, a precursor of the Thunderbirds that toured around the country, building the profile of the Army Air Force in support of making it into a separate branch of the military. He was flying a performance in California when his wingman, Pappy Hurst, failed to pull out of a dive and crashed. And I wanted to land way down at the end of the, at the end of the field, but they made me taxi right in. There was a little lump of people. They didn't know which one, but they just knew one had crashed. And I had my visor down, my oxygen mask on. I didn't want to get out of that airplane because his wife was standing in that little crowd. And finally I put my head down, took my helmet off and stood up and backed out. And I glanced over my shoulder, she was dead gone. Olds reformed the group as a team of four and went on flying shows for the remainder of the air show season. He also planned a flight from California to Washington DC for lunch and back in a single day. He and his wingman got lost in clouds over West Virginia. When it seemed like enough time had elapsed, they dipped out of the clouds to see where they were. They were right over the Washington Monument. We hadn't asked anybody's permission to do this or told anyone that we were going to do it, but the press got hold of us, so they were flight following us by telephone, you know? And the Pentagon heard about it, and they were furious, but, you know, especially the the, uh, off the information people, because they hadn't been cut in on it. The publicity stunt worked. The idea of flying so fast that you could cross the continent, have lunch, and be home for dinner captured the public imagination. In 1947, the Congress voted to make the Air Force a separate branch of the service. Olds missed the Korean War. He had recently married Ella Raines, a movie actress, and was convinced that she or powerful studio people she worked for pulled strings to keep him out of combat. He revamped gunnery training for the fighter forces in Europe, but was angry that he missed the war and came back, he says, with a chip on his shoulder. Assigned to the Pentagon, he started fighting what was then the prevailing wisdom that in a nuclear age, fighters were irrelevant. Uh, my boss, a two-star general in the basement of the Pentagon, called me in one day and said, Robert, or Major, no, Colonel Olds, said, I'm sick and tired of these studies you're forwarding to me about our lack of uh, tactical air capability. I want you to understand, Colonel, and get it through your head. We are never again going to fight a conventional war. That was in 1962 just about the time the first American Army forces were deploying into Vietnam. In 1966, Olds, then 44 years old, was angling for a combat assignment when he got what might, in other circumstances, have been good news. He was on the list for promotion to general. Now what am I going to do? I don't want to be a general. Because the war was just heating up over there in Southeast Asia. I miss Korea. I would damn well not going to miss this one. Ohl's only option was to find a way to get himself off the promotion list. To that end, he staged an impromptu, low-altitude aerobatic demonstration just outside of London. Sure enough, Ohl's commander called him in. He pulled out a piece of paper, waved it in my face, said, you can't see this, but that says you'll never be promoted. I think now we're getting somewhere. Then he waxed really furious and eloquent, and finally he shook his finger at me in utter rage. And he said, and you, the kind of Air Force officer that ought to be in Southeast Asia. And I jumped up and saluted him and said, thank you very much, sir. He walked out of the room. And he was still shouting at me. Colonel Robin Olds, at the tender age of 44, was sent to command the 8th Tactical Fighter Wing, based in Thailand. On the way over, he stopped off to see his old friend, fighter pilot, Jackie James. I heard, overheard them talking, and he was offering my father a position in his wing uh, in Thailand. He said, oh, really? You own Thailand? I said, yes, if you come over, you can be my op operations guy. You can be the deputy commander for operations. And then when Colonel Garrison uh, goes home, uh, um, you can be the uh, vice commander. What do you think about that? And he said, well, uh, that's fine, but that, uh, that wing is primarily a reconnaissance wing. He says, nope. He said, uh, that's all going to change. Olds arrived and James wasn't far behind him. 
and the 8th Tactical Fighter Wing did indeed change. He knew what he was getting into from his World War II experiences, and he knew the way the war was being fought in Vietnam, and he trained his people to fight that war, and he protected his people, which was a large part uh, accounted for the success they had as a wing. The two officers drilled their pilots in air-to-air -air tactics and demanded of them the same steely discipline they demanded of themselves. And they became known as Black Man and Robin. And they shot down more MiGs in one day, more enemy aircraft in one day in the famous Operation Bolo, Bolo MiG Sweep as they called it, than any other organization did. Old slew an incredible 152 combat missions in Vietnam. He shot down four North Vietnamese planes, bringing his lifetime total to 17. I asked him once uh, whether he really had uh, the rumored fifth uh, MiG. And his quote was, and this is a quote, I choose not to answer that question. And the reason for that is that he had been told that when he got the fifth MiG, and it looked like he was going to, that when he got the fifth MiG, they were going to bring him home. And Robin Oles is a fighter pilot. And he wanted to stay with his wing. He wanted to stay in the war, in the fight. And there has always been a suspicion he may have gotten the fifth uh, plane. Nobody really knows but him, I guess. He came home disgusted with the failure of his government, but inspired by the accomplishment of his men. They were proud of themselves. They had every right to be. We were doing what we were told, and we were doing it well. And we, we admired, respected, loved one another. It was a very tight, wonderful unit. Still is to this day. No, nobody feels sorry for himself. Bowles returned to the United States in 1967 and took over as Commandant of Cadets at the Air Force Academy. There he became a living symbol of the Air Force, a direct tie between its origins in World War I, where his father served, and the era of missiles and laser-guided munitions. He did have a major impact on a whole generation of fighter pilots who met him at the academy. He inspired a lot of people who would later go on and fight in Viet the Vietnam War. I loved being in the Air Force. I loved the responsibilities that came my way. I met them head on and with everything I possessed given to the jobs that I had. I wouldn't change that for anything.